Hi, my name is Dr. Tibor Lazar. I'm the owner and surgeon for Lazar Veterinary Surgery. I'm going to talk about cranial cruciate ligament tears in dogs and cats, and then uh, after which I'll talk about surgical repair. Uh, I want to start out by thanking Webster Veterinary Supply for allowing me to use their um, illustrations. This is a wonderful app on the iPad uh, called uh, DIA. Uh, what we're looking at here is a tear of what we call the cranial cruciate ligament in dogs and cats. In people it's the ACL, it's the same structure in uh, dogs and cats with a slightly different name. The structure on the right is normal and on the left it's torn. The way we uh, make the diagnosis of a cruciate ligament tear is with a particular manipulation called cranial drawer. And I'm going to show that here. The two bones above and below the knee joint, the femur and the tibia. And if I put my hands above and below and I can elicit this type of manipulation called the drawer sign, it is really conclusive for a cruciate ligament tear. And so it in a complete tear, it can be a very easy diagnosis to make. In a partial tear, it can be a little bit uh, more challenging in some uh, situations. Now, as far as the big question is, why did this happen? Usually there's some event running in the yard, playing with another dog. Uh, however, in dogs, uh, it's typically a slow degenerative condition. It's falling apart for, right now, unknown reasons. Uh, there may have been some event but it tends to be fairly minor in nature, and if it wasn't that event, it could have been something the next day or the next week. This is different than it is in people. Uh, in people, it's uh, a normal ligament that's torn with a skiing accident, car accident, some sudden trauma. In cats, we also tend to see this sudden traumatic form rather than the slow degenerative cause in dogs. It doesn't really matter why it tears. The repair is still the same, but it's important to realize this condition in dogs because many of these dogs will end up tearing the other knee. Statistically, there's about a 40% chance that the other knee will have the same problem, and very commonly it occurs within a year. Sometimes they're torn at about the same time, and sometimes we will repair both at the same time. Uh, the typical uh, signalment or uh, presentation on a dog is um, a small, medium, or large breed, basically any dog, uh, the ages that we see are typically three to eight years of age, although we certainly see dogs as young as a year of age or even a little bit younger, and we see some older dogs, 10, 12, even 14 years of age. There's another structure in the knee called the medial meniscus. Uh, there are actually several structures, but that's the most noteworthy because we very commonly will see that tear. As that drawer manipulation occurs, uh, it will commonly cause a tear in the back part of the meniscus. It's really impossible to identify in most situations on a physical exam, uh, although sometimes we will uh, appreciate a popping sensation which could be characteristic of that. It's something though that we do need to identify at the time of surgery because if it's torn we need to remove the torn portion. So now I'm going to talk about the TPLO procedure for repair of the cruciate ligament injury, uh, primarily in dogs, but potentially in cats as well. The abbreviation stands for tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. This technique has been around since the mid-90s. It was pretty radical when the technique was first developed. It was completely different than the repair methods that had been attempted Previously, the uh, surgeon Barclay Slocum was a very outside-the-box thinker, and uh, he came up with a very clever answer. Instead of fixing the cruciate ligament, the goal of the surgery is to change the way forces are acting at the knee. We're going to change the anatomy so that we essentially don't need the cruciate ligament at all. So let me go through these illustrations and talk about the procedure. Based on measurements that we make on the x-ray, we will cut the bone, the tibia, which is the bone right below the knee joint, and then we will shift the top part of the bone, the tibial plateau, it is naturally at a downward slope of about 25-30 degrees. We are going to rotate it so that it's closer to zero, 5 to 6 degrees is actually the goal. Once we get it in the position that we like, we use a stainless steel bone plate that will span 
the gap, the osteotomy or the area that we've cut the bone, and then we put stainless steel bone screws on either side to secure the plate up against the bone. The purpose of that is we need the bone to fuse, and <clears throat> the bone will not fuse unless it's completely still and stable. So I, I've done a number of these techniques since the 90s, and uh, I've been very, very happy with the results. It started out as a technique initially for the large breed dog, but then uh, as years went on, the implant sizes were developed, so really dogs of all sizes could have the surgery. Uh, as far as potential complications go, the biggest concerns would be a break of an implant, broken screws we've seen from time to time. <clears throat> That's not uh, too concerning. But if we see a break of the plate itself, that could be a big problem. It may require a second surgery. We'll sometimes see breaks of the tuberosity itself, or another bone which you can't really see from this angle called the fibula, which runs parallel to the tibia. And if the top portion of that breaks, then very commonly we need to do a second surgery to fix that. Uh, as far as minor complications, bruising, swelling, it's not unusual to see that sort of thing within the first few days, but it does tend to resolve uh, fairly quickly. Even though it's a fairly dramatic surgery, we're cutting the bone, uh, surprisingly uh, the dogs will start using the leg quicker for the most part compared to uh, some of the less um, uh, extensive surgeries. So uh, the limb we presume must feel more stable, more normal for them. The aftercare, we're looking at two months of restri restricted activity. Of that, the first month is the most important. Uh, the first two weeks is absolute rest, outside just for potty breaks, and no running, jumping, playing, no doing stairs, no furniture, and that really applies for the full two months. But the first two weeks, it's really rest, let the incision heal. Once the sutures come out in two weeks, we will start doing some slow leash walks, five minutes, multiple times a day, uh, and then at the one month point, we will have you recheck with your family veterinarian to have x-rays taken as long as the implants are in their normal position and there's no evidence of any complications, we can increase the activity by a bit more. Initially, 10 minutes uh, of walking instead of the five. After another two weeks, we go up to 15 minutes. So that takes us to the two-month point, and at this time the limp should be fairly slight. Most dogs we can still see a limp. Some may not be limping at that point. Uh, we'll take x-rays at two months to assess the implants, and also we want to see the bone healing. We want to see evidence of the bone filling in down there and up there as well, and as long as all is progressing well, we will very rapidly go back to normal activity. At two months out, generally we will allow use of stairs and uh, walking around, even a gentle trotting in the yard, but we'll wait till closer to three months out until we truly get back to the, the full activity.